You're watching Chili Boy Productions. I'm Larry Chili Boy Chilson, and this is my Pride Series month review for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now, if you don't know, every year I do a Pride Series of film reviews for significant LGBTQ films throughout history, and we are kicking this year's Pride Month off with one of the most iconic cult films in history. And to join me in discussing this iconic film, I have my friend, Ren. Hi, Ren. Hi. I should say now, friend and co-host of the Cinema Snarks podcast, Ren. Correct. <laughs> but every year, you're on here on my channel to discuss typically a drag-related film to kick things off on Pride Month. So thank you for coming back. Um, but we are hopping in the time warp to go back to 1975 with this British musical horror sci-fi sci-fi <laughs> film sexual <laughs> fantasy extravaganza <laughs> that has gone on to become the longest running film in theaters in history at this point starring tim curry susan sarandon meatloaf barry Bowstick, and patricia quinn um when were you first introduced to the Rocky Horror Picture Show? Oh, uh, you know, okay, so I'm a theater kid, which we have to go over all the time. I feel like it is a <laughs> fundamental piece of every single you have of the Ren discussion. But uh, I feel like I always kind of knew that Rory, a Rocky Horror Picture Show existed somewhere in my mind. I definitely got more exposed to it in high school. Like I started to like know kids that went to go do the Rocky Horror Midnight Showings. I think I probably watched it at one point, like high school. Okay. Um, and then it is also a musical, like a live musical. And so I've seen a, bu a bunch of versions of that. Um, and m for when I was a senior in college, my, one of my like big projects was that I did all the makeup for college production of Rocky Horror. So I have a very intimate connection with Rocky Horror. It's also, um, and we'll get into this, it's also like as a film nerd, it's a great film nerd movie. So I, I want to say like high school was probably about the time that I got like introduced to it, but it doesn't ever feel like I was like, what's Rocky Horror? It feels like I always knew. <laughs> so. Yeah, high school was the first time I had ever seen it as well. For me, as I started to just broaden my horizons in life generally, because it wasn't something that I uh, necessarily was doing up through high school, I really started to warm up to and open up to stuff like Rocky Horror Picture Show. So it was definitely upon like a rewatch that I got it. I got what the the intense love was yeah. <laughs> upon the rewatches. And of course, this is a staple not only for the lgbtq plus community but just for like i mean theater kids obviously the weirdo well. community the yeah. weirdo community and i think you find that a lot uh throughout history a lot of films that you know the queer community really latch on to overlaps quite a bit with just weirdos outsiders anybody who feels mm -hmm. outside the norm is they they have a lot of overlap and this is one that really just yeah. took off with the masses. Warm reception upon release, nothing big or crazy, but C critically panned. None of the critics understood what the shit was going on. They <laughs> all were like, "What is this? This is horrible. This is campy. It's no sense. And what is happening?" And you know, everything they hated about it is what all of the weirdos loved about it. Yeah. And why they go to midnight showings of it still and, you know, bring all their props and craziness. Uh, Tim Curry famously got denied entry into a midnight showing of Rocky Horror Picture Show because they weren't allowing impersonators into the show. And <laughs> she, the woman working the front ticket was like, I mean, you do kind of look like him, but no, you're not getting in here. <laughs> so she didn't even get in. 
Uh, and uh, Tim Curry also famously had a little bit of a, a falling out with acting post Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, I didn't know uh, that either. It was all too much. He, he was like, "This is this, and these fans are a little bit too much for me. I need to, I need to distance myself from Frankenfurter and Rocky Horror." So he kind of took a break, and he went back to like music and a little bit more theater before making his like gradual return to to bigger film work so you know. and thank god he did or we would not have had the many many treasures yeah. <laughs> i mean i'm not gonna lie my favorite tim curry thing is probably muppet treasure island oh, okay. which i know is ridiculous but i mean like rocky horror obviously is its own like category of thing but post rocky horror <laughs> Not gonna I lie. Like, hmm, what do I go to? Like, well, probably Pennywise for me. I just, I mean, I do. Well, that love does feel like you. <laughs> Pennywise is definitely like next. You know. Sorry, I, I think those are appropriate picks for knowing <laughs> you and knowing me. That those sound right. Those sound accurate. <laughs> but what's your favorite song in the film? Oh, uh, this is a good, good question. I find myself like singing along to it as it goes through because. Uh, you know, if you've done the musical once, you've heard the music a million times and they're all just like in your head. Um, yes. I think I really just like the like classic Rocky that uh, science fiction. <laughs> okay. Ooh, double feature. Yeah, like the, the Rocky horror show. Obviously, Time Warp is like a good, great, fantastic one. Um, yeah, um, those are like the classics, um, the big ones, right? your favorite song from the film uh, i mean it's hard not to just gravitate toward time warp because it just is like yeah it's just outside so of the film too and it's so fun in the film it just is like this really wacky you're like what the hell is going on as you're entering this house? Yeah. <laughs> these people and yeah we kick off with a wonderful musical number and how many yeah. good like fun musical horror -y type of sci-fi films do we have Right, well, I think that's one of the things that makes this a cult classic and just makes it amazing is that it like checks <laughs> so many boxes. And it's partially like, that's kind of what uh, Richard O'Brien, so for a fun fact, if you didn't already know this, everybody who is a Rocky Horror nerd should know, the guy who plays Riff Raff, the guy who wrote the show. Um, and this is pretty much the only thing he's done. He also, uh, has anybody, if you've ever seen Spice World, have you seen Spice World? I have seen Spice he's World. He's like the evil guy <laughs> that like climbs out of the, um, the toilet. Oh. That's, that's it. There's not a lot of other things he's okay. done, but those are his like big things. Um, interesting uh, resume interesting <laughs> resume i mean again i mean let's just be real it's all in the gay culture it was rocky yeah. horror to spice world we're st we're sticking to the culture yes. here <laughs> but um but he like it, it, yeah it checks like every single box and so like you can watch it at halloween yeah. it's this great like fun science fiction thing it's very draggy for the weirdos it's for the it, it absolutely has like a very pro sex angle to it which was i think was probably the biggest um at the time i think it was one of the biggest like pieces of it that people go like oh yeah because you know it's the 70s so it wasn't quite it wasn't 60s but there's a little bit of that like 70s conservative backlash and I think so, it was really progressive and overall for for a 1975 film we have a openly bisexual pansexual you gonna say pansexual because he's an alien, alien man <laughs> uh alien man thing uh that <laughs> yes. that on screen uh, attempts to uh, seduce a woman successfully <laughs> seduces the man um, and, and builds his own sex doll. <laughs> and builds his own. And it's just. And, yeah. And about... you know that he was with Columbina too. So he literally just jumps from person to person to person. He also doesn't seem to. Uh, he's not just pansexual. He's pansexual in the literal, like everything sexual. Like, when you look at like Columbina and then you look at Meatloaf. And those two body types are as divergent as they could be. And yet, Frank and Furter is all about it. He's like, I love the muscles, but he also loves the, you know, tiny, tiny little women or the, the big 
what do they call those bears? I guess I can use like a bear. I don't know if you look like a bear. Yeah, maybe he's a bear, yeah. right? He appreciates all the body types. <laughs> and obviously, yeah, in the 70s, not just being Dream it, be it. Yes. Yeah, uh, be, but being like sex positive in an open way like that was yeah. certainly like not just sex positive. Like you know, you can have sex and you should enjoy it. It should be pleasurable. It should be fun, and yeah. everybody should do it. And uh, so he is a bit possessive. He is a bit <laughs> possessive. Yes, he gets. He wants to have sex he with everyone. But, but you then all. Lil Rocky is not allowed to pursue his own. <laughs> He's so upset. No yeah, I love Tim Curry in this film. It's just like the whole drama of all of it is incredible. There's so many reasons why this is iconic. There's all of these moments where they say things that you just like have to repeat immediately. Um, like you're all wet. <laughs> it's raining. <laughs> I always think one of my other favorite songs is Damn It, Janet. Oh, it's yeah. just so good. I love you. <laughs> it's just so good. There's always these little like comments. Touch it, touch it, touch it, touch me. Right, like uh, there's just so much good stuff in there. I love how extra Frankenfurter is, right? Like from the start to the end. <laughs> yeah, top to bottom, he's fabulous. He knows he's fabulous. When he like freaks out, he like freaks out intensely. <laughs> really like a lot, right? He goes from like, party, people. yeah, party, party, party to murder, right? Yes, he gets <laughs> very like he's so upset at Rocky because Rocky chooses Janet instead of him. We're not sorry. Real quick, just to be clear, we're not gonna spoil any of this because if you have not seen rocky horror picture show i don't know how you even exist in our cultural reality yeah no, so just facts uh we're gonna tell you talk about the whole thing almost a 50 year old film <laughs> i think i also really appreciate the like consistency of it like a lot of times when you go camp there's like somebody in the movie that doesn't know what's going on doesn't know that they're not in a serious film yeah. and every single person in it knows that they're in this ridiculous campy thing and is playing camp properly. I actually think my favorite, I'm thinking about this movie and everything that's great. And uh, at the end, after he kills Frankenfurter and Rocky, again, spoiler, Riff Raff's uh, sister, Magenta, says, You killed them. I thought you liked them. They liked you. And he says, They didn't like me. <laughs> Nobody likes me. I think that's also one of those moments that every single like weirdo officer goes, "Yeah, they didn't really like me." We can all die with that. Even if you're like at every single party and it really seems like everyone likes you, you're still like, "Nobody likes me." <laughs> Don't tell me that. Yeah, me basically. <laughs> I will say I've watched this movie a lot, a lot of times. And the first couple times I watched it, I like just kind of lost interest and focus as soon as all of the like weird alien stuff starts to happen. Um, now that I'm older and I have had to sit through four hour movies on a regular basis, half an hour, an extra, <laughs> at half an hour of like weird alien shit that doesn't really make any sense and things go off the rails, which is a lot to say for a movie. <laughs> Like Frankenfurt is that at some point it goes off the rails. But now as an adult, I'm like, this is this is all consistent. It's fine. It doesn't bother me at all. I have no qualms whatsoever. I think my only question still is what happened to all the party guests when they are they all aliens? I think they're aliens. They get on the shit. Like, yeah. I guess they're all aliens. They all just gonna like disappear and then it's just like very <laughs> tiny bit. Yeah, the bit, yeah. Together. You couldn't pay them to be there for shooting that whole time. Get out, so. leave, please. <laughs> just gonna do Brad and Janet. And yeah. <laughs> Obviously, and this was a big revelation uh, for Tim Curry to the world. I'd say um, this was. Uh, no, it, again, <laughs> my own personal life. Uh, it was my first exposure to Tim Curry. And then probably wild thornberries. <laughs> and Fern Gully. That's right, he's Nigel. He's Nigel and then Fern Gully as the damn villain. Um, and then we then we got to Rocky Horror a little bit later. I mean, just an icon, like all around icon. Um, this is where 
he's just so damn fun. Like he is. I, I think him and David Bowie are responsible for the sexual awakening of many a bisexual across the world, across the English speaking world for sure. For sure. Potentially everywhere else too. But yeah, I have this confusing feelings at this. I think that's another thing that makes us a very LGBTQ friendly. Mm -hmm. He's very non-binary. That's the other thing is that like, you know, is this a drag film? Like I would say it's a drag film because he really does tend to favor the makeup, he's more not, girly lingeries and things. But not like, trying to be like a cross dresser. Like, you know, not, he's not trying to pass no. as a woman or look like a woman at all. Correct, correct. It's very and androgynous. I, yes. And I, I think we've also read the transvestite thing with that sort of as a as a as an identity to kind of get lost a little bit i'm sure there are still people who identify as transvestite you don't hear i do hear from i just think much, that the term has been like frowned upon <laughs> it does as, like it does seem to like because like transgender and transvestite those are two very different things yeah, yeah like it's it's in a weird area i remember laverne cox because they did a not so good uh fox live production or whatever of rocky horror to celebrate its anniversary Mm -hmm. um and laverne cox played frankenfurter uh -huh. and so i guess it was a big conversation she had with the director about should we change the lyric of sweet transvestite because i don't want to confuse she like is today transgender. yeah but ultimately her perspective at least was you know this was a movie of the 70s it was it's a product sure. of its time its history and so they kept they kept the song yeah. as is for also, their production as well frankenfurter is not trying to change his body and doesn't does, frankenfurter is comfortable in the body yeah. that i think he has been the, the term basically was, was like more of just cross-dresser yeah. correct like it's just yes. Yeah, a man a, or i guess it could have been a woman but it was clothes yeah men wearing women's clothes uh <laughs> i think there's also like a certain aspect of it that um you know ed wood is is very like influential on this film and ed wood he made all of these terrible sci-fi films these legendarily bad sci-fi films that are also often shown at midnight showings plan night match space but he also did a film called glenn or glenda which was about him as a transvestite like that was a big thing is that um he he was a transvestite and he was a, he liked women but he also just liked wearing women's clothes it made him feel close to women it's part of the movie it's part of the character it's part of a pun i don't know see and that's yeah. the history that's what like drag and so much of queer culture has been rooted in and mm -hmm. in today's day and age and oftentimes i'm right there too uh queer people are on kind of on the front lines of correctness and of this social justice uh, wave and of making everyone feel included and i think obviously that's great i think everybody should feel safe to express themselves how they need to express themselves but also our culture is so rooted in this just kind of more effervescent fun campy not serious nature yeah. throughout yeah. history and it's it's been a little bit stifled i would say in the current yeah. queer landscape because yeah. of that and a lot of people are looking back on these older things and like oh yeah. you know is uh, doing think pieces on is rocky horror picture needed anymore should it stop being shown because its themes are very out of date and this and that and you know certainly there's always a discussion to be had i think yeah. there's always a discussion to reevaluate and say sure should we relook at how we view a film or how we view this but also Let's be real like it's it's a the sex positivity message i doubt that like here in our puritanical america we're ever gonna not need some sex positive messages that are literally like explicit right that aren't just like over sexualizing women yeah. or just like idealizing sex period mm -hmm. that like really focus on that like pleasure is good like like explicitly the other thing i think with um tim curry is you know is <laughs> the song is what it is and it's calling himself a transvestite we've really started to expand a lot more on the non-binary and <laughs> if frank and were to be reinvented for 2022 
I imagine he would just be non-binary, that he From would use... non binary Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't work as well. <laughs> you know, we'd have to... We'll work on it. A couple more drafts. A couple more. We'll, we'll run it through the drafts. Sure, but... sure. <laughs> but no, Tim Curry's just so perfect for this role. Not only... He has, obviously, the iconic voice, which is why he actually did so much voice work throughout his career. Like, as you start listing it off, you're like, oh, wow. He did do a lot of animation voice work. <laughs> um, but his face is just so expressive. So expressive. Those She's eyebrows. Amelia Clark, he was the blueprint for you, girl. Uh, but I love seeing Susan Sarandon in a fun role. Because they're for, yeah. you know, we don't get to see her in this a lot. Um, so, so oh, yeah, I'm looking at, right, like, now it's gotten to the point where I think I'm older now than Susan Sarandon was when she did this film. So. Same thing with Barry Boswick. And so, like, you watch it now, you're like, oh, my God, look at that beautiful, smooth skin. No, <laughs> I can't Hello. forget. I'm like, yeah, I probably would try to, <laughs> to seduce them, too. Let's be clear, both yes. of them. Come on in. <laughs> Let's sing, yeah. And Rocky, ooh, well, Rocky. I mean, <laughs> yes, a so beautifully sculpted, perfect yes. human. Meatloaf, well, you also were an anti-vaxxer, so that was a strike against you late, but no. <laughs> but he's his own legendary He is his own legend. And I did love that somebody was like, everybody's listing off music and these other things. I, my claim to Meatloaf is Rocky Horror. Always. <laughs> They're like, screw the music career. I think of Rocky Horror first and foremost. Yeah, I think the first thing I knew him from was um, I would do anything for love, but yeah. I won't do that because that music video was like on a constant rotation. And it was, you know, <laughs> this beautiful woman and this weird canon. All right, dude. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it's very confusing. I won't do that. We're like refrain. It was all very strange. And then it was also very strange to watch Rocky Horror and be like, is that that's the guy? Yeah. That's the guy from the anything but love. Huh. Hey. He's always kind of felt like the strangest piece of the Rocky Horror puzzle. Um is not bad. And he's yeah. also like, he is just really. He, I mean, like, he's also kind of just campy, like, his whole kind of career. Yeah, well, I mean, he literally named himself Meatloaf, so, Correct. you yes. know, like... <laughs> it's not like going back anywhere from that once you... You gotta go there. I mean, it's over. It's over. Your meatloaf. career has been made when you make yourself Meatloaf as your stage name. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna do one word, one name, like Cher or Madonna. No, it's just like the fun physical comedy of it all too. Like when he does do the seductions and we just have that stupid like the silhouette. Thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> behind the like uh canopy on the bed. <laughs> yes. I how like he comes in and he like it's clearly very Bosworth's like outline and everything and perfect voice. And she like pulls off the wig and it's all of a sudden it's Frank Furter. <laughs> It's, it's got that, that charm. I, uh, Patrick and I have been watching Doctor Who and like part of what makes Doctor Who great is the fact that it is low budget. I think that's what also appears to like all, appeals to all of the like drag queen performers and theater kids is that it feels like something we made. Like, you know, the, the switches that they pull, all of the little like science fiction gadgets, like yeah. none of that is like multi-million dollar production value cgi it's all just like this glue and popsicle sticks put together to build a fun campy world random pool that they fall in like get into at the end one of the other things i just love about it again is like a like a film nerd is all of these different moments that are like iconic movie moments that are then like recreated the pool is because like they used to do all the synchronized swimming scenes yeah. in the old movies and you know, they literally talk about Fay Ray. Fay Ray was the um, the, la the blonde lady from King Kong. Just like as you're going through, there's just so much that makes you go, oh yes, yeah, that's, that's iconic right there. Oh yeah, that's great, yeah. I think that's part of what makes it so strange is that it's like, it's like they're just trying to jam as many of these like nods as possible to the old school films. Yeah. And all of their sci-fi ridiculousness, the, the plan nines from outer space, that kind of stuff. Why do you think the film is still like resonating with 
you know, the little queer kids, the little weird use of 2022 with all the outdated effects. Uh, it, you know, it didn't look great to begin with, even in 1975 and you yeah. know, in 2022, if you're watching it for the first time, you know, you're going from well, like I realistic looking CGI movies every weekend to, you know, this. <laughs> Or drag well, race, and you're used I to think, these beautiful beat yeah. mugs of drag. Right. Too. Yeah, we were talking about, like, when you watch the movie. So I was sitting and doing my makeup while I was watching the movie. And in your mind, you remember this very iconic look for Frankfurter. But if you're just sitting and watch it, you try and copy it by, like, looking at the screen. Because makeup changes a bunch of times. Like, it's very clear that there wasn't, like some specific person with a very clear vision and really high quality makeup and tools and things that like had this idea that they like created every single night like for every single shot like there's there's a little bit of like oh okay he's like clearly sweated a bunch of it off but to answer your question i think that is precisely um the the lack of quality is precisely what makes it timeless you know, when you watch a movie from the 90s it's trying to be top of the line you watch it now and it's cringy but like because it was campy and it knew it was campy and it intended to be campy all of those campy elements all of the like low budget props and things like that they just fit into the world and they make sense and it so it isn't jarring it, there isn't a moment of like oh i think there's also something about it like <laughs> you know you watch friends again and there are pieces of it that are cringy, that are like kind of hard to like, from this perspective to like deal with. You rewatch Wacky Horror and there really aren't these like strong cringy moments. I mean, like we talked a little bit about the transvestite thing, but at the same time, it, it's, ne it's never done in a cringe inducing way. None of this yeah. is ever, none of it ever comes from, it's not mocking right like it, it's because everybody if any if we're mocking anybody we're mock we're mocking brad and the brad and janets of the world yeah right like the they're the weirdos in our world of weirdos they're the ones that need to be like pushed Changed. out of their square little box. <laughs> They're the ones that give in to the passion. Yes. The normies yeah. are the ones that are strange and need to be like freed from yeah. their shackles from their societal shackles and i think i think that's always you know but we can hope that at some point it becomes less necessary but you know i think all of us go through a period every weirdo is going to go through a period in like high school or something where they just like they haven't quite figured out who they are yet and i think that's a big part of like what rocky horror is is just like whatever you are is cool man like Go be you. And if you can dream it, be it. If you want to be a transvestite from Transylvania, you go for it. You want to be a weirdo who's super into Halloween, a little doc kid, knock yourself out. You want to be just the rainbow pixie human, go for it. Like that, it just encourages kids to like figure out who they are and like roll with it. Um, so I think that that's what makes it timeless and always incredible. I mean, there's also just like, there's so much culture behind it now, right? Like it's like an experience for us all to have together. It's not just this like random film that you're trying to show to your friend. It's like, there's a whole thing with it. I think it's just the fact that it's a musical is a big part of it. Like, I like music. <laughs> Duh. You like music songs. and Ren is at least like in to see what it's about. If she knows that there's music involved, she's ready to at least give it a chance yes. and hear it. Yes, I make theater with a lot of very cool theater people, and I am usually the minority voice who's like, and we need some songs in the show. <laughs> and they're like, nobody likes songs. I'm, like, I'm sorry, everybody likes songs. They all do. And so if you ever do come to see an Audacious show, I promise there will be music. There will be songs. We don't do musicals, but heck if we don't put on a show. <laughs> Perfect. Well. The Rocky Horror Picture Show, I don't know what else we could possibly say about it than what we've said here, what you've heard on the street, what you've heard through the numerous different <laughs> think pieces that have been out there through your drama school and uh, yes. teachers and all of that. Everybody who's ever talked about it Entire over the past- Entire college <laughs> courses just <laughs> built around Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> But that was just our two cents on this iconic 
queer classic. We definitely want to hear what you think about the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I want to know when you were first introduced and a little bit about what your experience with it has been. Leave those comments down below or you can hit me up on Twitter. Also, if you liked this review, make sure to hit that like button down below and subscribe to the channel so that you are always up to date on all of my latest videos. Ren, thank you so much for joining me yet again. Where can people find you if they'd like to follow? Well, you can follow me on Twitter, but I don't do very much there. And you could follow me on Instagram at rennypoo 13 But mostly you want to go to the Audacious Theater website. We have a show coming up over the summer, Great Gatsby. Uh, it's both an evening at Gatsby's and you get to dress up and be fabulous and go to a 1920s party. And if you're here watching us be fabulous, I imagine you are ready. And it is happening in June, so it's feeling very, very festive. Yes, perfect. And make sure that you check out our podcast, The Cinema Snarks, wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. I love you all so much for your continued support. Thank you for watching. And... We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.